Hey, everybody, this is Kristen V. Carter with Trust Your Magic Podcast, where I talk to friends, family, and colleagues who trust their magic and inspire me to trust mine. And today I am here with the one and only entrepreneur and producer, Tarek Ross Jr. Just so you know, he is my podcast producer, so he is typically behind the camera, but today he is in front of the camera. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. Absolutely. I love your clips on IG when you're like, I'm in front of the camera now. I'm like, yes, I'm going to see what I'm in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel, it's funny. I feel like it took me a while to get into being in front of the camera, being comfortable. Because I remember with Helping Homies Win, it was all audio. And we had tried to do like maybe four episodes on camera. And it was so awkward. It was very hard. Really? Very what was hard. awkward about it? Um, I think I was just so aware of the cameras. Uh-huh. I was so aware of them. I was thinking what other people were thinking. Right? I used to act. But yeah. Um, yeah, after maybe high school, I started to get really, like, self-conscious for some reason. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then I, I eventually got comfortable. That's when we started doing Win Wednesday with uh-huh. my Create Space. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I'm good. I'm good now. And then there was no more podcasts. I went back behind the camera. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you ever do another one? Are you thinking about doing another one? That's the plan. Tony's okay. actually in town right now. Oh, okay. He's in town right now. So we're going to be talking about that this upcoming week to, like, figure out, you know, where we are now that okay. things have kind of settled a bit. Would you ever do something solo? Yeah, I, I, 100%. I have a plan for something solo right now, actually. Okay. That I'm working on. So, okay. yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Like, I feel like I definitely need to. You saw the clip I did with the yeah. test here. Uh-huh. There was like, oh, come on, bring, bring back a podcast, do something. <laughs> I'm like, it's coming. It's coming. I'm cooking up yeah, something. Yeah, because so. how many episodes did you have of Win Wednesday? Uh, I think we did 15. If I'm not mistaken, really? I think we did 15. All of them, maybe posted? a little bit more. Yeah, they all posted. Oh, no, no, no. You know what? I think three of them didn't post. Okay. Or I didn't pub them. Three of them did not. So I think we had, we actually may have had 20. Oh, Honestly, we may wow. have had 20 total. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, so. I'm like, so what's with the not pubbing? Because I definitely, I, I saw five. Um, so technically, not, te- I mean, just, I think. Where La Create Space was and like what they wanted to do and how they saw that, I think was one way, one thing of, about it. Um, I, mean, I still have all the content because it's helping homies win. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I kind of just let that be something that I did specifically for La Create. Okay. So it wasn't really like big on me pumping, okay. even though you saw me on camera. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about the first time we met. Do you remember? Um, yeah, I do remember. We met at... Um, Cal State Fullerton, we were there for Council of African American Parents. They had a career day. Um, and I was working at Mount San Antonio College at the time in outreach. Mm-hmm. And I had been involved with CAP, like the, the council, um, for some years up to that point. Uh-huh. So when they reached out for the career day, I thought I was showing up talking about my job and like Mount Sac. Yeah. And when I arrived, I realized it was about me as a person and like my journey. So on the fly, I had to really like switch things up. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, we met, um, you were doing a session mm-hmm. about your career, your journey. I did one on mine as well. Um, I, I think I remember us like connecting a bit. And really then, briefly. Really briefly, yeah. right? And then I remember you reaching out and you had told me you were listening to the podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was the podcast with my dad. Yes. It was Speak yes. On It, right? Generation yeah. to Generation with my dad. <laughs> and it was so interesting because that whole process of me doing a podcast with my dad was really for, um, it was a vision he's had, right? And I was there supporting, trying to figure out how to do the podcast uh-huh. thing. I bought so much equipment that I still have and storage really? somewhere that I did not need at the time. But I, this was, that was my first introduction into like the podcasting space, trying to put something together. Um so even when it came down to the content, I didn't expect anyone to listen. So when you had reached really? out and said that you were listening, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and the feedback you get, you gave was so intentional as far as like the importance of it and how excited you were. And I remember that being one of the major moments that made me feel like, you know what, I do need to take this seriously and recognize what yeah. we're documenting. You know what I mean? How, um, I guess, uncommon that was. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. At the time, I didn't know anybody who was doing podcasting, number one. But then also, I just felt like I remember meeting you and going like, who's this young man? Like, he seems super talented. Mm-hmm. I listened to your podcast and then I bumped into you at USC. There was a John Singleton talk, I think. Um, Yeah, it was uh, LA 
LA Uprising? Went, yes, LA yes. Rising. LA Rising. LA Rising. Mm-hmm. And then I bumped into you again at Array. At I Array. was doing something with Ava DuVernay. And mm-hmm. then that's when I said, you know what? I need to learn, like, <laughs> what's going on? I know Tarek is into education, but I mm-hmm. feel like there's something deeper going on. <laughs> wow. It's funny you said that because I think even at the time, I didn't know something deeper was going on. Uh-huh. Like, I've always had really? interest in entertainment, uh-huh. right? So I studied communication, public relations. I, you know, interned since 10th grade in high school, mm-hmm. all the way up until maybe maybe my second year of college in the entertainment world, Mm -hmm. just trying to get a feel for what was going on. I had an interest in like the way that it worked, but I had no idea that I would actually make a transition at any point into being involved in this space. Yeah. Yeah. So growing up, were you involved in entertainment or performing arts at all? Growing up, um, I ran track. Mm -hmm. I uh, played basketball for some time. Um, and then when I got into high school, I started acting. Okay. Right. So acting was my thing, like theater. Um, I was in improv, uh, the improv shows. Um, we did, you know, drama plays. I hosted our pep rallies, mm-hmm. our talent shows. And then when we ever had music, like in the quad during lunchtime, I'd always be the one on the microphone. So okay. I was a part of leadership or ASB, a part of the special events committee. So I feel like I always found myself like on the mic in front of people, entertaining folks, you know? Yeah. So I definitely, that's the I'm about my performative like background, I would okay. say, performance. Okay, so you did that in high school, but then mm-hmm. you made a shift and decided to study something different in college. So how did you make that transition? Ooh, we so college. Um, you know, my school was really big on pushing us to go to college, mm-hmm. and I think I applied to about eight or nine different colleges at the time, and. All but one I applied to as a theater major. Okay. Um, so the only school that I did not apply to as a theater major was the school I ended up going to. Wow. Yeah. So Cal Poly Pomona is where I went to undergrad. I um, studied communication, public relations, mm-hmm. uh, because that was a skill that was transferable. My dad was really big on like, make sure you have something you can fall back on. You know, you never know what happens, but it still lets you be in entertainment, mm-hmm. but still have the option of other routes. Um, so... That transition, I think that that my senior year, things got really tough, like the beginning Mm -hmm. of my senior year, because my acting coach uh, and like theater teacher um, ended up leaving the school. Like he was like a like a long term substitute. Mm -hmm. And right before my senior year, they had him had to leave to go get credentials. Mm -hmm. I was heartbroken. You know, I was like, oh, this is supposed to be my moment. He was giving me direction. He was in the industry. I kind of just lost the like the interest after that, mm. you know. Um, I feel like I didn't have that person really guiding me and giving me direction. It wasn't something that my parents or my family or anyone I was connected to really had insight on how to give direction. So I think, you know, that background in entertainment was just a skill set that I had. And I was a part of other programs that were really big on like student support services, like yeah. student support programs. And that's what kind of ushered me into into school. I had already mm. been involved you know, and all the leadership things in high school. So I kind of took that leadership route, you know, and it kind of transitioned me out of, out of like performance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in terms of leadership and education, how many years had you been doing that or have you been doing that? Man, I would say since 2010. Okay. Since 2010. So about 13 years I've been involved in some form of education. While I was in college, I worked in admissions and outreach. Mm -hmm. I had another job like working inside the games room, but I was always involved in like the outreach element, really helping kind of translate, you know, the world of higher ed to Mm -hmm. students, helping them really understand how they can use it as a tool. Um, And, you know, that journey kind of just kept continue to blossom, you know, from, you know, being being a student, transitioning into a leadership role, trying mm-hmm. to help facilitate that experience for students that were already at the college and students who were in high school looking to transition. Yeah. OK, mm-hmm. so that was happening. But then I feel like in the back of your mind, you were always <laughs> thinking about entertainment and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. At one point, did you say, you know what, maybe I should switch lanes? Oh, so coming into college, I would say probably was where it really started Mm -hmm. because after I graduated, I threw a party in Carson um, at this like venue. I lost a lot of money, had to go to the bank to pull cash out to pay the DJ and the venue. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, I got to college and started to really see the opportunity as I was connecting with so many people from different areas. We always were looking for a place to get together. Um, So I started throwing parties in college. Um, And then a group of friends and I, we all lived in this house called Mm -hmm. 5710. And we started, you know, throwing house parties that turned into throwing parties and events. I mean, like at actual event venues. And 
um, yeah, I would say that was probably where the entertainment element, mm-hmm. I think, came came back into play mm-hmm. of like finding ways to bring people together and kind of facilitate this thing. Um, just community, uh-huh. you know? Okay, so okay. That probably definitely was like the moment that I was like, oh, I have a skill set here. Okay. All right, yeah. cool. So I met you a few years after that. So mm-hmm. you're talking about the parties, but then mm-hmm. I would see you out with a camera in your hand. You were doing podcasts and mm-hmm. then you were doing game nights and, you know, during COVID, we were the two people, I think, doing game nights all the Fine. time. And I remember, I think, just taking you aside, like, Okay, so when is this going to be a thing, Tarek? Because you obviously have a gift for bringing people together. Mm -hmm. You obviously have a gift for entertainment, figuring out, you know, curriculum or even ways to organize people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're mentioning the you're mentioning the parties. But when did you start to say, okay, maybe I want to do a career shift or even a career collaboration? Collaboration. (laughs) Yes, it's it's been a collaboration for so long. Um, I would say at that point, I remember I was doing student support programming. Mm-hmm. I had, did some programs in LA at a high school, bringing the the students from a high school out to Cal Poly Pomona to learn the campus. And I was always in need of a photographer and a videographer. Mm. And I would hire people, but then when I would get the photos and the videos. They weren't really in the way that I needed them to promote the next event. So I went and bought a camera to do it myself, yeah. you know? So when I started doing it myself, it was literally with the intention of I'm doing this so I can market my education services. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people see you with the camera, they're like, hey, do you, have you ever shot this yeah. before? Can you come in studio? I'm like, no, I don't do that. Well, can you try? You know, and I would deny it for a while that I realized it was an opportunity to make money. Um, so I started doing that. I did that maybe for like four or five years, mm-hmm. but I never really got into it to get serious, to really, you know, I think master the craft. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just something I think I loosely understood and I was able to use. Um, and then from there, like I mentioned how the podcast started with my dad. Mm-hmm. So then all these skills started to come into play. I started to understand audio a little bit more. I already had the camera experience a bit. And um, it was something that I realized was a great side hustle mm. to the work that I was doing. And I realized that in that space, there was this, I mean, even still, I find myself recognizing the ability to even like direct and kind of bring that story, that same skill set of like creating curriculum and education. Mm-hmm. How do I do that with people that I'm working with to bring that idea to life? So yeah. um, it's something that had been brewing for a very long time that I wrestled with for, you know, really up until recently, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was it about it that had you wrestling with it? I, you know, I think it's just the way that society is set up, right? Mm. You go get the college degree, you go get the job. Um, I think we think about security in the sense of, oh, get your education. And the idea of getting a job is secure, right? It's this idea that you're going to have a paycheck, you're going to have benefits. Mm. So anything that was against that, you know, doing freelance or going on my own about it. I don't have that same idea of security. Like I right. mentioned, I wasn't in a lot of spaces where that was encouraged. I was in spaces where the opposite was encouraged. Mm-hmm. Get the nine to five, you know, get your tenure as an education, mm-hmm. you know, uh, pension, like all these things yeah. were the conversation. So, you know, I wasn't a, in a lot of spaces that would kind of help shape that for me. Um, and I really believed and knew the skill set that I had in this space mm-hmm. of like entertainment. Uh, but I didn't trust it. I didn't trust it. And it, I think it definitely is a reflection of my, my like relationship with God mm-hmm. and like really being able to let go and trust that the skill, the skill set that I have, the opportunities that have been presented to me are things that I can also, yeah. you know, rely upon and, and, and move forward with. Yeah. Well, I know mm-hmm. we had a lot of conversations through the years, but what made you decide to go from the nine to five to saying, you know what, I'm going to take the leap of faith mm-hmm. and become an entrepreneur and become a freelancer? Um. We had a lot of conversations, <laughs> really, really, really long conversations about it as well, because I'm like, wait, my mind is telling me this uh-huh. and that. And I had to really, I think, check the box off of everything I was more so concerned about. Yeah. What are people going to think? And, you know, am I wasting an opportunity? You know, and um, really, I would say being in conversation with people like yourself who are doing it, you know, so many key people in my life. I started to get connected to and be more intentional with the questions I was asking to help kind of deconstruct some of the ideologies that I was holding on to for so long. And I just start getting exposed to more opportunities. You know, I started my production company and being offered opportunities to shoot different podcasts and people flying out, flying uh, my team out to go shoot. And I'm like, wait a minute, these things are happening and I'm not really going out to pitch myself. Um, And it's, it's, 
it's doing well. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, I really started to get even more intentional with the conversations I was having with people in education about the ability to have impact. Because that's something that's big to me. I want to have impact, mm -hmm. right? I want to help influence the next generation and give them the tools to really see themselves as like, you know, recognizing the story that they're in, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I started to realize, well, one of my friends, Ishmael, has said this, and he talked about it was very selfish for him to stay in the classroom, mm. right? Because his gift is for the masses. And if he stays in the classroom, he's only going to reach out, reach a limited amount of people. And I started to look at the work I did very differently. I realized it was the same skill set, just in different industries. And I have the opportunity to still provide that level of impact, to still be you know, in the trenches, as my mentor says, yeah. working with the individuals. Um, so I had to get over that idea that I was abandoning education and students mm -hmm. um, and recognize that even in this work, I'm still doing work that's meaningful. Yeah. Um, so I had just recently, maybe, you know, a few weeks ago, had some really some really intentional conversations around the planning, like, mm -hmm. you know, being able to pay my bills, being able to really mm -hmm. scale my business, being able to build wealth. And I realized I had all the tools I needed. You know, I think the space felt very familiar that I can think back on where I wasn't as mm -hmm skilled or had the business knowledge on how to kind of run things. And I realized while the feeling may be the same, I have a different set of skills that I can trust and rely upon. And it may just, it may jumping or taking that leap yeah. of faith a lot easier. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your production company, Trademarked, and just mm. some of the things that you've been working on thus far. Oh, okay. So Trademark Productions, um, we have been, um, I, 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 so let me take it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Trademark is a company that I started maybe three years ago. And a lot of the work that I was doing, again, was like the photography, videography, and uh, like consulting I was doing okay. here and there okay. for like helping people bring their projects to life. Um, but I would say around December 2022, okay. um, I had got my first contract working with Breakbeat Media, mm -hmm. uh, producing Bill Bellamy's podcast. Um, and that was probably one of the first moments where I realized, OK, this is actually happening on a different level. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I had been working on a virtual podcast with Breakbeat. You know, you and I have been working here mm -hmm. on Trust Your Magic. And those were areas I felt like I was learning so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when uh, we started working on Trust Your Magic, I think it was the first day I was like, wait a minute, Kristen really does this. And it hit me like, I don't know if I prepared myself for the yeah. fact that this is work that you do. You know, so even you trust me with opportunity to do this. I was learning so much in that process, you know, and I would say by December was when, you know, it hit me like, OK, I have to present myself as this because even in spaces where people ask what I did. And even if I was in an entertainment space, I would still tell people, oh, I'm a college counselor, I'm a. Mm -hmm college professor, you know, um, I wouldn't walk in the role of I run a production company. Um, I'm a producer. So, um, yeah, December 2022 is when that really started to take off. And since then, we've been doing Bill Bellamy's podcast. Um, we have another podcast on the Breakbeat Media Network, um, Trash Talk with Bubba Dub. Okay. I've had the opportunity to travel to uh, provide uh, corporate social responsibility videos mm -hmm. for um, Come and Go, which is a convenience store based out of the Midwest. So we've been traveling, creating um, video packages, highlighting the different individuals that work with the organization and community partnerships. Um, and I got a couple that are coming down the line okay. that, you know, I'm looking forward to announcing soon. OK, cool. So with Trademark, do you find that you're able to blend your education and entertainment? Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. I think that's the part that I really enjoy um, is kind of having a conversation with someone, figuring out what their values are, mm -hmm. and then discussing what it is that they want to bring to the masses, what they want to bring to people, and finding a way to kind of connect the dots. Yeah. You know, it's the bridging that gap. And it's, I liken it to my experience when I'm counseling students. They're coming in like, I want to get a degree, but it's like, well, what, what, what do you want to get a degree in? Why? What are the values? How are you making your decisions? Mm -hmm. Because of, you know, how much money you want to make, this and that. I kind of take that same approach when I'm working with clients as far as what, who are they reaching uh, what are they currently value and how do we showcase that value in a way that, you know, it's through a podcast or through a video. Yeah. So really helping kind of direct and have those conversations mm -hmm. more. So yeah. it's the same skill set. OK, so going back just a little bit in terms of education, what were some mm -hmm. of the titles that you held and then what was some of the responsibility? OK, so in education, um, I went from. 
an out, a student service outreach specialist. Uh-huh. Um, I worked at the community college, so I would go out into the community. So typically people liken it to a college recruiter. Mm-hmm. Um, but because we were at the community college, we were, you know, pretty like well known in the area. We would go out into the high school and kind of build a relationship with the students during their senior year, helping them how to apply to school, mm-hmm. understanding the resources that were available and kind of just connecting the dots and kind of giving them that soft that warm handoff to the next professional at the college. Um, And then I did that for about five and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I decided to leave that full-time job and go part-time. I had went and got my master's degree in college Mm -hmm. counseling, student development, um, emphasis on the student development piece, because that's really why I made that decision. And I became a college counselor and professor. So I would meet with students Mm one-on-one, help them kind of put the pieces together um, as far as the classes they should take, the direction they should go in. And um, I would teach a class career and life planning, helping students understand and um, connect with their values and make better informed decisions yeah. from that place. So that was my uh, my role. Um, I moved over from that community college to another one in Pasadena, um, essentially doing the same thing, but this time for our Black student population. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. So when I hear you mention that, all I hear is your love of people and mm-hmm. growth and expansion. What is it about that that lights you up? Oh, man. Um, I believe in people. Like, I believe in people, you know, and I think we all have had experiences through life that have kind of maybe dimmed our light a bit, you know, that have made us, you know, feel a bit discouraged in certain spaces or um, as though we couldn't pursue the things that we love. Mm -hmm. And I think we often kind of get ourselves in this web you know, that kind of adds a lot of pressure to our decision making. Yeah. And my hope is to be able to have conversations to help people feel seen, uh, to kind of undo some of those tangled parts to free themselves and feel like, you know what, this is what I have available. This mm-hmm. is my gifting. And this is how I want to express that to the world. Yeah. And finding a way to help them survive, not, not just survive, but thrive in that, mm-hmm. in the way that you know, their bottom line is taken care of. Yeah. And we've had a lot of conversations through the years about this very thing, yeah. about you stepping into your light. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, it's so it's ironic, Derek. isn't it? <laughs> so when you're saying that, I'm like, oh, look at this. Look at this full circle. Mm-hmm. So just being where you are now as an early entrepreneur, you said three years mm-hmm. as trademarked, but then your first major client was December, just mm-hmm. months ago. What have you learned about yourself so far? Oh, I learned I could trust myself. Okay. Um, I learned that I can trust myself. I learned that, um, again, like my faith being such a big component that um, God can bless me in this area as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the, the construct that I have to work a nine to five was something that, again, has just been a, a result of my environment. Um, I've learned that I don't have to be great at everything, um, that I also don't have to stress and worry about the things that I'm doing. Um, I've learned that in the process I'm putting myself back in position of being a student, Mm -hmm. allowing myself to be new to a space, um, to kind of approach situations head on as I'm having conversations with different clients and and having these um, realizations, these eye opening moments to be able to figure out what I need to do to make the adjustments or create the systems Mm -hmm. that help it flow better. You know, so um, I would say definitely allowing myself to become a student again, knowing that I can trust myself and, you know, really just trusting the process. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you mentioned a few things, so this might still be the same answer. Let me know if that's the case. But what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've had to face? Now you're dealing with teams and hiring teams. What's that been like for you? I think the hardest part, so I think I do a great job at like working with people, Mm -hmm. like again, connecting and being present. I think the hardest part is um, maybe creating a, a system that, meets people where they are as well Mm -hmm. to kind of figure out how to get the deliverables, right? Whatever their service is, making sure that we can get those things in when we need them, how we need them, and really creating a process that is seamless, easy to understand, but yet effective and like it produces high quality. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the hardest, right? Because I think in this world, you know, a lot of people, I'm like, I feel like I'm competing with Mm corporations that are paying people salaries. So working in the freelance world, um, bringing people on, it's it's finding a way to make this experience worthwhile, um, helping them understand like an impact component of mm-hmm. it so that they're invested in the team and what we're doing, uh, but also being realistic that they also have other things that they need to do to survive. So it's, it's kind of towing that line of how do I bring people on and and support the vision, but also trust the process as well for themselves. Mm -hmm. So really trying my best to like pull what they most value. Okay. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then just in general, because you've mentioned values a couple of times, Mm -hmm. what are your values and like, how do they even thrive inside of Trademark? Mm, What are my values? So um, I value um, meaningful relationships, Mm -hmm. right? So I I really value being able to connect with my friends, find out what's important to them um, and using that information when we're in, in, when we're connecting, whether it's in business, it's personal, we're just hanging out, socializing, um, I value community. So being in space where we all can thrive, I think the synergy that's built in shared space Mm -hmm. um, pushes us and sharpens us. You know, I think one of the things I always say is like, you know, we talk about iron sharpening iron. Mm -hmm. Um, The other part of it that I like to share for me in my mind is is recognizing that iron sharpens iron because iron gets dull. Mm. Right. And I think oftentimes we get dull and we want to hide and we want to isolate ourselves, but not realizing that the sharpening process, the sharpening is a part of the process. So when we find ourselves being down or discouraged or not, you know, at our best, that those are the moments we probably should lean in most mm-hmm. to community to really make the most of, again, those, those experiences, the relationship, our skill set. So that those are two things um, I value, meaningful relationships, uh, community. And I would say restoration. Yeah. Uh, restoration. I think restoration is extremely important. I think we live in a time where, again, you know, we're quick to cancel people or be offended. But there's something special about the process of being able to lean in and talk about mm-hmm. what offended us, how we can make, you know, concessions or have conversations to address these matters in order for us to build even more intimate and intentional relationships with others. Yeah. I think you do an amazing job of that. As you're talking, I'm thinking about all the conversations that we've had and Mm -hmm. then just even growing with Trust Your Magic and figuring out the podcast and all of that. You've always been, I think, really gentle and Mm -hmm. also just really understanding. Like, Where does that even come from? Because that's very rare. Like if somebody is challenging you or even being calm, I feel like you have the same demeanor all the time. Like where does does that even, I remember being on the phone with you and I was like, Tarek's not upset. Mm. Oh, he's just listening to, you know, what I'm saying about like, Mm. here's, you know, here's what I want to do with our next season, X, Y, Z. And you're like, okay, great. Like, Where does that come from? Because you mentioned not being offended. A lot of people, when they get feedback, whether you're growing or not, constructive or not, people Mm -hmm. are quick to be like disappointed or upset. How do you take criticism Mm -hmm. or how do you take feedback so well? That's a great question. Um, It's so interesting because I feel like there's spaces where I don't always. Mm -hmm. And historically, I haven't always. Right. I've always been one to sometimes when people give feedback or critique, I'm quick to defend myself. Um, and my mom always used to tell me, like, you know, if you go somewhere and somebody walks in there and says, your name is Richard. And I'm like, no, my name is Tarek. Mm-hmm. No, your name is Richard. No, it's Tarek. And if they run off, his name is Richard. His name is Richard. I'm not going to go chasing that person to mm-hmm. get them to know what my name is. I've already done what I need to do. I corrected them. They still kind of want to go with that. Um, I think that that story kind of represents my process a little bit more now with where I am. Um, it definitely took me becoming a lot more aware of what I look like when I'm offended, what Mm. I look like when I'm sad, when I'm happy, when I'm frustrated, you know, when I'm, I need to know what I look like at every emotion so that I can recognize when I'm in space with people, when those emotions are coming up because I'm familiar with them. Mm. I think when I'm not familiar with my own emotions, I'm quick to try and defend myself because I'm trying to figure out where this is coming from. And I think that level of emotional awareness for myself has been beneficial in moments where people are having conversations with me about how they feel, about things they're not happy with, things they are happy with, because I'm able to process that and not feel like my character is on the line. I can be secure in knowing, hey, this is what I value. This Mm -hmm. is what I'm confident that I've been moving in in some capacity, but for whatever reason, there's a disconnect. So let me listen to find out how I can take that information and be more aware and considerate of the people Mm -hmm. I'm in relationship to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really great, especially when you're starting something new. It's never just completely smooth. You have yeah. a growth process. You try to figure out like, okay, what's this person's personality? What's their skill set? What's their process? Mm-hmm. Even when you mention like, oh, Kristen does this. Yeah. <laughs> does yeah. this. Like, I'm always curious. Like, I wonder if other clients have the questions that I do because I'm typically not in the seat. I'll say this is a special interview for me because we're both not really in this seat much Mm -hmm. and to have the opportunity to actually sit down and talk with people. And for me to talk to you, I remember doing your podcast Mm -hmm. before. So it's like such a cool opportunity. But when you think about being in a new space, new things come up I do in a new space. And Mm -hmm. I think you just do a great job. I definitely am learning so much from you as well. I received that. Um, Just in terms of just moving forward and 
being like, okay, what's, what are my values? And then also like, what's the objective here? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So, um, I'm thinking a little bit about the company that you keep. I've always been so impressed. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, if they know Tarek or if Tarek hangs with them, they're good people. So tell me a little bit about your community and why your community is so important to you. Mm. I would say my community is important to me because I grew up, I have a sister, a half sister. She lives in a different state. Mm -hmm. And for me, I grew up as an only child. Right. And uh, my relationship with other people my age were all my cousins. I had Mm -hmm. a big family. My grandma had 12 children. So cousins are everywhere. You know, we grew up with this very tight dynamic, even though we weren't inside the home. We always had family gatherings. And that was really important to, I think, just my identity overall. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, recognizing in spaces that I wanted to build with other people. I wanted to learn other people and like be exposed. Like I'm really observant of others and like what makes us move the way we did. I think if I could redo school, I would probably study sociology for that reason. Right. Um, So at this point, I would say um, I feel as though I associate with my people. I associate myself with people who I can trust the way that they think. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And because of that, I take those relationships very seriously because, again, I talked about being present and understanding what's important to them. And I think we hold each other accountable in that way. Um, So the individuals that I'm around, hang out with, we do business together, you know, we we vent to each other, we support one another, we hold each other up, we, Mm -hmm. we do everything together. You know, that is so important to me because that space, again, has an impact on how I see myself. Yeah. It has an impact on how I show up at work. It has an impact on the way I treat people I don't know. Mm-hmm. So it's really important to me that that stays intact, you know? And I think when those spaces are challenged, um, I have to go through this full process with myself. Okay, why is this space being challenged? Mm-hmm. What are the values here? How do we get back to restoring mm-hmm. order or what this new evolved relationship looks like, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So that's really important. Okay. No, I think that's awesome. And it's amazing to see a group of black men that, that are leaders in the different fields that mm-hmm. you guys are all in. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about Helping Homies Win. Helping Homies Win has gone through so many iterations, yeah. I feel like, right? Uh, when it first started, it was birthed from, I was taking my first trip to Uganda, mm-hmm. working inside their, their, their prisons. I was doing a campaign and there was this idea that, again, when I had my camera, I was shooting other people, taking photos, doing videos. And this was the time where I felt like I gave people an opportunity to pour into me. Uh-huh. Um, and the hashtag helping homies win was like that idea because that kind of represented my journey up until that point. So and you just did a hashtag at the it time? It was a hashtag at okay, the time. Okay. It was just a hashtag, right? And the idea was like, yo, we should do a dinner where we bring all the people that I'm connected to that are my homies, where they mm-hmm. brought one of the people in their life that helped them win okay. into this conversation, right? Never yes. happened. That never oh, happened. But it was yeah. a great idea. You yeah. know what I mean? You should still do that. I should. I definitely when, should. I'm like, you all don't take that idea, yeah. okay? <laughs> this is your idea. I'm like, when is that happening? Yeah. Let me know. 100%, <laughs> right? And I think even more so now, it's a lot more clear about mm-hmm. helping homies win. Um, but from there, it kind of evolved um, when... Antonio Bell, the co-host of Helping Homies Win the Podcast, had said, hey, bro, you and your dad have a podcast. We should do one because we were having conversations that we felt like we want other people to hear. Um, So it became a podcast. Clubhouse happened. Mm -hmm. um, And that was a big moment for us. We transitioned the podcast to Clubhouse. Yes. I was going to say you guys are the number one mental health, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. number one mental health house space, whatever they call it now at Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my gosh, look at this. And I was blowing up your phone like, okay, so what are y'all doing? What's the next thing? What's the next step? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we went on Clubhouse and we were on Clubhouse early. um, Early enough that when we were building relationships, it was with a lot of people who were like the tastemakers, if you will, in the entertainment Mm. industry. Um, Tech had kind of phased out a little bit because they were really on it. And the entertainment came in, I would think, the, uh, the last quarter of 2020. Um, And we got on at that point. So the relationships we were building and the consistency in our rooms had allowed for us by the time, you know, like a year later or so had amassed over 100,000 members uh, because of the rooms we were doing. And again, they were very intentional with community building and your values and leading from that place as humans, as people before our roles and positions. Um, And, you know, from there, it just became this space. And I think even now uh, what it represents is being able to, again, get in a relationship with 
with people and find ways that we can help each other win. Yeah. Um, and I think it's about us celebrating every win, not just waiting until it's that promotion, but it's that opportunity to say, hey, you know, today I've I've changed my attitude. I've changed my mind about something that I was struggling with. You know, so it's really about creating spaces that reflect that. Mm-hmm. So it isn't just, oh, just a podcast or this you know, dinner series that's going to happen. Right. But it's really about an attitude. It's really about an approach. And I think, again, my love for people is because I do want to see help. I do want to help homies win. Like I'm very big on that. So um, I I would say it's more of like a lifestyle collective Mm -hmm. more than anything. And I think the way that we continue to expand it as time goes on, um, I'm excited to see it continue to blossom in this next iteration. I am too. And Mm -hmm. it's necessary. I think that all of the offerings that you bring, there's a space for it. And I feel like you continually step into those spaces. And I'm always excited to know, like, what's Tarek doing? I appreciate um, that. So I'm looking forward to that dinner and yes. all the things. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I'll make sure we do that this year. Yeah, for and sure. I think like a card game. I'm still waiting for the cards. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So we've been talking about that. Um, uh, that was one of the biggest parts of it, too. Because, again, on Clubhouse, I think Clubhouse was a really great I know that Clubhouse was a really great pilot for us Mm -hmm. because we got a chance to exercise all that we wanted to do beyond the podcast space and creating a a, a morning group where we affirmed one another. We Mm -hmm. talked about our intentions for the day or for the week. Um, We did spaces where artists can share their art. Uh, We did games that just allowed us to connect on a human level and just kind of take a breath, you know, from our busy work schedules, our lives that we had. Um, So the, the card game kind of birthed from recognizing the healing Elements of just conversation, being able to sit down and have a conversation yeah. with someone does something to us, you know, and I think that's why we love podcasts and it's, it's growing so rapidly now mm-hmm. because of that. So the card game is a is a is a birthing of our recognizing of the uh, importance of, yeah, of conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you've talked a lot about taking leaps of faith with your production company. Mm-hmm. Are there any others that you still haven't done that you are like, okay, now that I've done this thing, it's encouraging me to do this other thing, whether it's personally, professionally, anything. Yeah, there's a few. There's a few. Okay. There's definitely a few. Uh, one of which is being real estate investing. Um, so my family and I got into business last year mm-hmm. doing real estate investing. Um, one of the properties we recently got is going to be finished soon, rehabbing mm-hmm. and really looking into finding ways to um, not only do real estate investing for ourselves, but also teaching our family and extended mm-hmm. communities on the value of wealth building through real estate. Mm-hmm. So um, that's something that I've been doing a lot of studying on okay. that I haven't yet like publicize and like try to like speak too much about, but recognizing that that's a really transformative space when I think about our communities and just mm-hmm. historically where we've been economically. Okay. okay. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to mention that you're working on? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. So, um, Another one of my jobs, I guess, right, which makes me an entrepreneur, is I work uh, with the formerly incarcerated population. Mm-hmm. Well, those that are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. Mm-hmm. So while they're on the inside, uh, teaching life skills, personal development classes, financial literacy, um, emotional intelligence, building healthy relationships, the list goes on um, with the Prison Education Project. Mm-hmm. So as a program coordinator, um, really responsible for training our volunteers who come in and teach these courses. Uh, we've been recently given the opportunity to expand to the 58 counties of California. Wow. So I'll be actually going on tour next month, what? touring all the different facilities, um, as well as college campuses in those areas to really start um kind of getting the students and the community involved in that rehabilitation process Mm -hmm. Um, because the Department of Juvenile Justice is closing down uh, June of this year. Uh, So we have a lot of youth who are going to be coming back to communities without support. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited that um, CPOC and a few of these other organizations in that realm and that world um, are entrusting us with the opportunity Mm -hmm. to take our programming and our services abroad to kind of be able to uh, implement these things that they feel like is important. I feel like we're definitely seeing a shift in people's uh, interest in what I would call like true re-entry, right? Mm. Like true re-entry support, not just saying that, hey, I'm giving you this money, but I'm also equipping you with the know-how in the community to make sure it happens. So I'm really excited about that work and where we are at this point. That's incredible. Mm. That's incredible. So just just so that we know, how did you even get into that? Oh, I got into it because of that program that I said I was doing as a student Mm -hmm. and I I got into a leadership role. Uh, My mentor, Dr. Renford Reese, is a professor at Cal Poly Pomona where I went to college and he ran or the executive director of the Prison Education Project, he needed volunteers. Mm -hmm. And because I was running that program at Cal Poly Pomona, I had 
a bunch of volunteers. So yeah. I just started recruiting them from this program into that program. And I had my camera and I was taking photos. And he asked me to talk about camera work and how I got it, how I got into it. And I told him, I, I told the students mm-hmm. and he was like, Terry, you need to teach. You need to teach. So I got the opportunity to go to Uganda. I taught an uh, intro to entrepreneurship while filming, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time. Well, yeah, while I was out there and I came back, he wanted me to go straight to uh, Ventura Youth Correctional Facility, mm-hmm. up, uh, not up north, but in Ventura County uh, to teach some of these classes. And that mm-hmm. kind of spiraled into me teaching more classes. And he felt like, you know, the work that I was doing was impactful. And, you know, I made my way up to program coordinator. That's incredible. And finding a way to you That's know continue incredible. to do that. So in terms of prepping, whether you are working with students who are in college or students mm-hmm. who have been incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, is there a difference in how you even like lesson plan? No. Okay. There is not a difference. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, part of my reason, like I mentioned, why I went to grad school wasn't for the the I like I, I didn't want to become a college counselor. Mm-hmm. Right. I love the opportunity and I love the work. But my reason was because I wanted to understand development. How do we develop and create a space, a structure of higher education college that can take an adolescent or a young adult into working class? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you do that in four or five years? Um, And that process helped put labels to what I thought was important in our development. And so when I work with students that are either from affluent areas, under-resourced areas, incarcerated, non-traditional um, that they have, you know, they're differently abled. Um, it's all about making sure that they see themselves reflected in the in the work mm-hmm. or in the lesson. And I do that through questions. I ask students, hey, how are you feeling today? Scale one to 10. I remember their names. When I'm calling on them, I'm saying their names so they feel seen. I'm incorporating something they said. Hey, you mentioned you like pineapples on your pizza. I don't know why that is, but let's talk about that a little bit. They feel as though I care and therefore they show up. They We built this trust and they show up for me. So I take that same approach, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's you know students going straight into college or students leaving the facilities uh, from being incarcerated. I think the reason why that works is because at the end of the day, I think we all want to be cared for, right? We all want to have this sense of belonging. And um, that to me is what's ultimately missing. It isn't education. It isn't jobs, but it's often what's happening in our homes mm-hmm. um, or the lack thereof or whatever those those things are. And if we find a way to bring that to people, I think we we begin to believe in ourselves. We begin to seek out support that can also encourage that. Yeah. And, you know, we see transformation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So lastly, how are you seeking support? Do you feel supported right now? Or even what can I do more to support you? Okay. Um, I do feel supported. Okay. Opportunities like this, right? Um, I think, again, our, our journey from with Trust Your Magic from the first season to where we are now um, has been extremely supportive. Our conversations, uh, uh, you know, really being a sounding board for me to kind of vet and say all my frustrations and all my fears and you being able to encourage me through what you understand is important to me, you know. Um, and I think, again, I'm in a much better place because of, you know, the process and work I've been doing or trying to do and continue to do with becoming aware of my emotions mm-hmm. to be willing to ask for help, to be willing to say, hey, I don't really understand this and allow myself to be a student, Um yeah, I think from there, it's really just continuing to connect with people who are in spaces that I want to be in yeah. and ask questions that allow me to to soak up the game. And I have to trust the process that as I'm soaking it up, it may not sprout for another year or two mm-hmm. or three, but being willing to endure and, and put in the time yeah. until I see it. Yeah. yeah. I just want to thank you, Tarek. You have always been an incredible friend. Thank you for... Uh, pouring into my dream of having a podcast. I've wanted to do it for some time and you were the person that came to and I'm honored that we get to work together on this. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'm just so excited for you. Every time I see you, I'm like, oh my gosh, the shining star. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, it's funny, my name, Tar- Tarek, but Tarek means uh, morning star. Really? It does. It does. It does. <laughs> it's a little random fact out there for y'all. well thank you so much for allowing me to take you he's typically guys he's typically back there so thank you for allowing this to happen for sure and i'm just so excited for you thank you thank you i'm excited (laughs) so guys this is another episode of trust your magic if you liked what you heard or watched please feel free to subscribe and we will see you next time